The Yamaha R1, one of the greatest leader bikes known to mankind. You want to go fast, you want to carve corners, and you want to adorn yourself in the royal blue robes worn by great racers like Valentino Rossi. You want a Yamaha R1, and that's because you have wonderful taste. And me here at Yami Noob, I'm going to help guide you through that wonderful taste and tell you everything you need to know about the R1 because you want to go and buy one. Well, how convenient for you, we actually have a Yamaha R1M we are giving away over at yamminoob.co. You best believe it. I just love you squid so much. I wanted to bestow upon you one of the greatest sport bikes known to man. And remember, it's not a regular R1, it's an R1M. So we've got carbon fiber bodywork and the fantastic electronically controlled Olin suspension, not to mention the intoxicating cross plane four cylinder engine. Take a listen really quick. That is good. This is an incredible machine and you could be the lucky winner. Head over to yamminoob.co and find out how to get entered to win. Every dollar you spend is going to be an entry to win and who knows, we might just be running a pretty sweet little multiplier. So go and check that out. And without further ado, let's get into today's video. The R1, where do we even begin? 2023 marks the 25th year anniversary of this machine. So I guess we'll start in 1998 before some of you might've even been born. The R1, whose full Christian name is the Yamaha YZF R1, was the successor to Yamaha's FZR1000 and subsequent YZF 1000R leader bikes. When the R1 first launched in 98, it used a 998cc four-cylinder engine that was able to put down 150 horsepower and 72 foot-pounds of torque, which is a whole lot of juice for a raw analog carbureted superbike. If you've never ridden an old bike with that much power, do yourself a favor and ride one because they're still wickedly fast and they're terrifyingly awesome. It weighed around 435 pounds and stylistically exuded peak Y2K sport bike energy with the round fairings and the little details like the drop shadow behind the airbrush styled YZF font on the decals. Mwah. Chef's kiss, so beautiful. Upon its debut, the R1 saw much praise from industry professionals and amateur street squids alike. The R1 set a new standard for power to weight ratio in the leader bike category. Its 998cc inline four engine produced impressive power and the overall weight of the motorcycle was kept relatively low, contributing to excellent performance. The R1 was praised for its handling characteristics, agility and responsiveness, in part due to its frame design and stacked gearbox, which created a shorter wheelbase for this machine. The R1 really set a new standard for the modern sport bike, predating bikes like the ZX-10R, GX-1000, and CBR-1000RR. The R1 is so esteemed, Yamaha created the YZF R6, a 600cc middleweight machine built in the likeness of the R1, which would go on to be a legendary motorcycle in its own right. The Yamaha R1 has seen countless changes and improvements in its 25-year production run. Here are some of the most noteworthy updates. For the 2000 and 2001 model year, changes were made to the engine and chassis as well as upgraded body bodywork for aerodynamic excellence. In 2003, the bike was upgraded further with the implementation of fuel injection and Yamaha's Exhaust Ultimate Power Valve, or XUP system, for improved mid-range power. For 2004-2006, the R1 saw a major redesign with a new frame and swing arm, improved suspension and brakes, and the Yamaha Chip Control Throttle System. And in 2009, it's the big update that y'all love. The distilled down from Yamaha's MotoGP bike, the R1 received an engine overhaul with their 270-degree cross-plane crank shaft design. This change, a first to be implemented in a four-cylinder motorcycle engine for large-scale production, creates improved power delivery caused by a reduction in inertial torque. This engine design is also rich in character as the uneven firing order almost sounds like a big burbly V8 engine as opposed to a traditional inline four. It gives us the absolute characteristic sound of the R1 and it is definitely one of my favorite generations. This is also the bike that Ben Spees took to victory in 2009 and I just think it's so iconic looking. This generation, which ran from 2009 to 2014, also saw updated electronics and traction control. And in 2015, this motorcycle received Yamaha's six-axis IMU system, which takes constant readings of vehicle speed, lean angle, and orientation to send inputs to the electronic rider aids such as TC, wheel lift, and ABS. I like to think of it as a little gremlin wearing a computer on its head, just tapping really quickly on a keyboard inside of the motorcycle, making it all work right. Since then, the R1 has received more engine tuning and electronic updates, including the addition of a quick shifter, ride modes, and a TFT dashboard. The 2015 body style is definitely
definitely one of my favorites. They recently revised it a little bit, but I still think 2015 is the best looking R1 that they've ever made. As for the current Yamaha R1, it still managed to be a contender for the best leader bike on the market today. It's 998cc CP4 cross plane engine makes 198 horsepower and 83 foot pounds of torque. Its chassis has been finely tuned and updated over the last two decades to make it one of the best handling motorcycles on the racetrack. The R1 also lends itself really well to a lot of different riding styles. So if you're a fast, aggressive rider on track, it will definitely work for you. If you're super smooth and you like taking your time, it'll also work for you as well. The R1 is lauded for its very flexible style. It is an entirely modern superbike with bounds of technology like the chip throttle, six axis IMU providing real time feedback, slide control, launch control, and wheel lift. Let's just say this tech package establishes more control than even the most domineering of father figures. The fully adjustable KYB suspension and four piston brake caliper provide ample handling and stopping power. The 2024 R1 is going to run you about 18400 bucks, which I think is tremendous value for money. But wait, there's more. As I mentioned at the top, Yamaha also sells the fully goaded R1M. The R1M expands upon the R1 platform using the same engine frame and swing arm, but differs in the use of electronically adjustable suspension from Olin's, carbon fiber bodywork, and stickier Bridgestone tires. The R1M is a pure race bred machine providing a substantial improvement in handling over an already highly capable bike. If you intend on dominating your local track or you're just a serial flexor keen on carbon fiber, the R1M is going to run you a spicy $27,000. Or you can head to yamanoob.co and find out how to win ours. Again, the R1 just exudes character and panache. It is so much fun to ride. The throttle is so crisp. Everything is adjustable and it is truly the most superlative of riding experiences. And come on, let's listen to that cross plane crank just one more time because it is just ridiculously delicious. Yamaha's R1 hasn't just been a squid missile on the streets, it's had its share of success on the racing circuits as well. Okay, they might not boast a track record as impressive as Ducati's, but the R1's had its share of limelight over the last two decades and has been a fan favorite. Their racing escapades have been a clear influence on the further development of the platform as racing tech makes its way down to full production models. The R1 tore up the Macau Grand Prix five times between 1999 and 2013. If you've never seen footage of this track, it is insane. I can't even believe they still run this thing. It looks so dangerous. John McGinnis conquered the senior and inaugural Superbike races at the 2005 Isle of Man TT in the saddle of an R1. And in the World Superbike Championship, Yamaha's riders Troy Corser, Nori Yukuhaga, Ben Spies, and of course, Toprak Razgat Leoglu left their own puddles of blue paint on the podium in 2008, 9, and 2021 as champions. Like I said, I think Ben Spies' 2009 series was just the most iconic. I love the way that bike looked. I love Ben Spies' riding style. He showed up as a rookie and just dominated everyone with the brand new R1. It's just such a cool memory and it just is super cool. But also Toprak is kind of waving the flag right now as the best Yamaha rider and it's so sad he's going to BMW next year. So, so, so sad. He has such a cool style and has really made the R1 his own. The Yamaha factory racing team clinched the 2015 Suzuka 8 hours endurance race as well before claiming victories in 16, 17, and 18. And in 2011, Tommy Hill won the British Superbike title on the wings of the YZF R1 as does Josh Brooks in 2015. Yamaha's racing efforts haven't just further developed the bike, but has long proven its reputation as a formidable and competitive machine. So we all know the R1 is on paper an incredible motorcycle, but what's it like to ride in real life scenario where we have speed limits and stoplights and big pickup trucks and young women with sequined steering wheels scrolling TikTok behind the wheel of a Nissan Altima? Truth be told, for many riders, depending on where you live, the R1 could be an incredibly impractical motorcycle to own. Around town, you'll rarely leave first gear and on the freeway, you could be doing double the speed limit in seconds. And look, I know what you're saying. Damn, that sounds pretty sweet to me, but hear me out. That isn't to say that for the enthusiasts of other bikes with disposable income and love of track riding, the R1 would be a worthwhile investment. That is, of course, bearing in mind that it is a luxury purchase based on a frivolous but addicting need for speed, high thrills, and sexy sport bike aesthetics. And there is nothing wrong with that. It is a motorcycle both for enthusiasts and experienced riders who understand the somewhat prohibitive nature of a bike like this. Also, it's really fun to be riding around and feel like you're wielding the entire five cards of Exodia at any time you want. It is so fast. It is so fun to ride. What is funny though is when you search Yamaha R1 on Google, many of the suggested questions are, is the R1 good for beginners or can I start riding on an R1? And though it shouldn't need to be said, of course you don't start on an R1, you start on a Turbo Busa so you can grow into the power. Duh. 
In the wake of the R1, Yamaha has birthed other bikes in their R line to cater to varying riders and skill levels. There is of course the Yamaha R6, the 600cc sport bike that is since being halted for sale as a street legal motorcycle, has now become the most overpriced motorcycle on the planet. It's like the R6s and OBS trucks are now like the most ridiculously inflated vehicles around. Seriously, anybody with the 2017 R6 thinks that it's worth $18,000. Guys, get real. It's still a great bike, it's dominated racetracks and 186 mile per hour highway poles for 20 years, but I'm not recommending anyone pay 16 grand for an eight year old 600, come on now. Then there is of course the R3, an acclaimed parallel twin beginner sport bike that was actually the bike I started on that led to the creation of this channel many, many, many years ago. And for the last few years, Yamaha's made the R7, which uses the CP2 crossplane twin engine pulled from the MT-07 with an upgraded chassis and sport bike bodywork. But of course, if you're watching this video, you want an R1 or similar. You're a testosterone-fueled 23-year-old who just got their first big boy job, where you get paid like 18 bucks an hour to do data entry despite having spent 80 grand on your college education. You want leader bike or nothing? Well, lest ye not forget the Yamaha MT-10, the baddest hyper-naked sold by Team Blue is based on the R1 platform. While the R1 has full plastics, clip-ons, and a highly committed riding stature, the MT-10 has a more upright and comfortable riding position. And let me tell you, you're not really giving up much with the MT-10. It's the same engine and same frame, just a little detuned for top-end horsepower. So it's making tons of mid-range torque. For most normal people, the MT-10 is the better choice. It features a naked bike design with minimalistic bodywork and a more relaxed handlebar setup, making it suitable for a variety of styles and conditions, including urban commuting and and longer rides. The MT-10 shares its engine with the R1, but it's been detuned for more low and mid-range torque, providing a strong and versatile power band. In the MT-10, this engine makes 158 horsepower and 82 foot-pounds of torque, but let me tell you, that doesn't tell the whole story. The torque in the middle is ridiculous on the MT-10. It just feels ridiculously fast. The MT-10 does take advantage of many of the tech features on the R1 as well, including the six axis IMU, rider aids, which we all love and enjoy, a quick shifter and the TFT dash. The MT-10 uses adjustable KYB suspension, which can be upgraded for semi-active Olins if you were to spring for the SP variant. The MT-10 and MT-10 SP cost 15,500 and 17,000 respectively. But I hear you, the sport bike chats in the comment section, the ones who act like naked bikes or motorcycle sacrilege, there's no way they would be caught dead on a more comfortable and more practical bike. So what are some leader bikes that compete with the R1? Well, Kawasaki ZX-10R has proven to be a formidable contender in the world superbike at the hands of Jonathan Rea, six-time world champion. Pretty good stuff. This motorcycle had a 998cc four-cylinder engine that makes 197 horsepower and 84 foot-pounds of torque. It uses Showa suspension, Brembo brakes, and has its own IMU-driven suite of electronic rider aids. The ZX-10R is slightly cheaper, coming in at $17,799, but you will not get that intoxicating cross-plane exhaust note you find in the R1. Additionally, similar to the elevated R1 M package, Kawasaki sells the ZX-10 RR, which is as close to their homologated race machine as you could purchase. It features Kawasaki's variable air intake system, upgraded pistons and connecting rods, forged wheels, and Pirelli Diablo Rosso Super Corsa tires. This limited production model costs a whopping $30,499, and in my opinion, if you're starting to creep up into the 30s, you might as well get a V4R, baby. But if you're basing your comparisons of the R1 off of World Superbike performances, the next worthy contender would be the Ducati Panigale V4 and the Aprilia RS V4 respectively, both using V4 engines so you get that unctuous engine character you just don't get from the Japanese inline fours except for the R1. The Panigale V4S has an 1103cc V4 engine that makes 215 horsepower and 91 foot-pounds of torque. This is not the homologated special, you're going to have to spec up to the V4R if you want that, so this does have a cheater, bigger displacement engine. But you will also find Ducati's own suite of rider aids as well as fully adjustable suspension and Brembo brakes. The base trim costs around 25 grand, but there's also the V4S and the V4R, like I said, if you want the true homologated experience, and as I mentioned, because I made a lot of videos on the V4R because I gave one away in 20. 23 earlier this year. It is ridiculously good. Watch all my videos on the V4R. It is the best leader bike I've ever sampled, ever. But this is about the R1, which is also really good. But the V4R, oh my god, it's so good. Now, the Aprilia RSV4 is another race bred Italian sport bike using an 1100cc V4 engine that makes 217 horsepower and 92 foot pounds of torque. Because Aprilia is not competing in the World Superbike category right now, they don't have a 1000cc race ready homologated package, so this is the only one they make. You'll find adjustable suspension, Brembo brakes, and Aprilia's performance ride control tech package. If you hadn't guessed by now, there's also the RSV4 factory, which comes with electronically controlled suspension to further sweeten the deal. 
vehicle. The RSV4 Embrace trim costs $19,000, which is a screaming deal for that much power and that big of an engine, while the RSV4 factory costs $26,000. But I will say the RSV4 handles like a bit of a pig on track and it's kind of a handful. I massively prefer the V4R or the R1 to the RSV4. Just my personal opinion. It is hard to deny that although it is frequently blown out of proportion, the cost of ownership and lack of dealer access for a bike like a Ducati or Aprilia may likely sway riders towards a Japanese sport bike. And of all the Japanese leader bikes, the R1 in base trim is really hard to compete with. It's highly equipped and sounds incredible. The engine makes a great amount of power and the cross-plane design truly sets it apart from its contemporaries from the rest of the big four. Any negative aspect to owning an R1 applies to leader bikes across the board, but if you can live with the impracticalities, an R1 will likely be one of the easiest, most rewarding leader bikes to live with. Thanks for watching the end of the video. Be sure to subscribe if you like what we do here. And remember, the R1M giveaway over on yammynoob.co is going to end in December. Do not miss your chance to get your chances locked and loaded to win a ridiculously good and superlatively awesome Japanese leader bike. Should we uh, play the track for some more cross-plane sounds? I think we should. Fact. In a historic 2016 match in Seoul, South Korea, the AI machine AlphaGo, developed by DeepMind, defeated world champion Go player Lee Sedol in four out of five games, showcasing the power of artificial intelligence and in mastering complex strategic tasks. This victory marked a significant milestone, sparking discussions about AI's potential and rapid advancements in machine learning technology. Goodbye. Keep watching, Yemi Nerd.